Okay, it's another episode of the uh, On.Net Show, and today we're going to be talking about Cosmos DB with Jeremy Lickness. He's a cloud developer advocate um, focusing on .NET, and uh, yeah, how about you tell us a little bit about um, what you do as a cloud developer advocate and um, how Cosmos DB fits into that. Sure, so I, I like to sort of flip the word around, right? I advocate for developers in the cloud. <laughs> but, but that's, that's a little fun. redundant. So, <laughs> to, so to be specific, there's, there's three main areas that we focus on. One is community, and that's getting out to user groups, conferences, meetups, meeting developers where they're at, understanding what they're looking to do, what pain points are, and, and just listening to developers, right, and bringing it back here to, to Redmond so that we understand what's going on in the cloud. Definitely. Yeah, that's a huge piece. The second piece is content. And that's producing videos, producing documentation, creating quick start sample applications, ways people can get engaged with the different product offerings that we have. And then the final piece is connecting back with engineering teams and bringing that feedback back to the teams, letting them know what we're seeing in the field. And also a lot of times we want to understand problems that engineering teams are solving so that we can go out mm -hmm. and share that here's this new feature, that thing you've been looking for is, is out, so let's you know, share it with the audience. Right, so hopefully it's a, this virtuous cycle right, sort exactly. of model. Right, exactly. Yeah, um, it, it's not going out and kind of preaching off the ledge. It's getting down in the trenches and then coming back and, and cycling around. Right, so you know, I have uh, Cosmos DB, it's obviously a database. Right. Um, so I've been using databases for many years, and my frame of reference, which is probably not completely different from our audience's frame of reference is you've got, you know, relational SQL Server, you know, primary keys, foreign t keys, um, table schemas, that kind right. of thing. And then, you know, I've also done NoSQL. Um, the place where I've done that the most actually was with Azure Table. And, you know, you just kind of, for each piece of data, you just basically pick the schema kind of almost on the fly right. that you want. And then you kind of um, develop these semantic style queries, you know, greater than, less than signs for the queries. You know, you know what I'm talking yeah, about, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so which one of those is Cosmos DB like, and how should I think about it in the more meta type view? Right, so it's definitely closer to NoSQL. Okay. And uh, I wouldn't call it relational, but what's interesting is there's a huge misconception in document databases because they're schema-less. There's this idea that maybe you can't build relationships into your query models, and maybe it's not as easy to index. And that's really where the power of a lot of NoSQL engines comes from, is that they're optimized to store a lot of data and to index over fields. But when I talk about Cosmos DB, one of the nuances with the way it works is that you get to pick your own interface, pick your own API. There's four APIs that it supports. Anyone familiar with NoSQL has probably heard of MongoDB, for example. So we have a driver that you create, Cosmos DB, and it looks like MongoDB. However, we recognize that there's a lot of developers very used to SQL syntax. So even though behind the scenes it's a document database and the schema can change, what the document DB interface provides is the ability to query using a SQL syntax, mm. which is refreshing to a lot of developers because they don't have to learn a whole new query syntax to interact with the, the database. It's still storing documents, but I can do select, star, from, group, by, and use the, the types of query syntaxes that I'm used to. Okay, that makes sense. Also, from um, an Azure perspective, I know we've had um, Azure Table, which we already talked about. There's Document DB, and now Cosmos DB, and maybe there's some other things. Mm -hmm. Do I need to choose which one of those that I want to use, or is there now like a clear choice of which one I should be using if I'm building a new app? Sure, so in, in most cases, if you're building an app, Cosmos DB should be the, the clear choice. We do have Azure Table Storage. Cosmos DB provides a table storage. We call it the, the premium experience because unlike the regular table storage, which is tied to that storage account, with the Cosmos DB, you get access to some of the other features that Cosmos DB has, such as geo-replication and setting consistency levels. And really, you know, I talk to people about it, serverless is a huge term, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to turn around without bumping into someone who's, who's saying it, and it's, it's really about less server. And the idea behind Cosmos DB is to host your data in a way 
that you care less about the server and let the Azure team worry about that for you. So you can set it up, configure, hit some switches and dials, and then it pretty much manages that experience, that scale, that consistently consistency level for you. So you talked about Document DB, it supports that interface. You talked about table storage, it supports that interface. It supports a MongoDB interface and it supports what's called Gremlin, which I always just like to bring up in conversation because it's a cool name for an interface, but that's what we call a graph interface. Oh, I see. And that's more, you know, the canonical example is I have airports and I have flight paths. So I'm storing it in a database that understands connections between nodes. And this is an interface that lets you query like what the path looks like and information about that. Got it. Now, if I'm building this new app, is there a Cosmos DB API or am I using one of these other APIs on top of it that you mentioned? You're using one of those APIs on top. Okay. So the Cosmos DB is just the, the resource and the experience for setting up the account to host your database. At the time you create that, you pick one of these interfaces and then you build to that interface with your application. Got it. Now, um, back to the Azure Table API because that's the one that I've kind of grown up with from an Azure perspective to, to know and love. Now, if, if I'm building my next app and I go into Azure, do I start from that kind of Azure storage node to, to make it um, Cosmos DB, or do I start from somewhere else? You would start directly from Cosmos DB. Okay, can we in take fact, a look at that? Yeah, let's, let's take a look. I've got a, a dashboard up in, in the portal. So the experience you're talking about, you create a storage account, and that comes with blob storage, file storage, queues, and table storage. Yep, that's the one. For Cosmos DB, what we do is we pick Cosmos DB. Well, and one question is, um, I saw the storage um, category there. Is Would I see Cosmos DB under storage, uh, or is it somewhere else? Or did I ask too hard a question? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so these are going to be more the backing storage. Okay. This is going to be more databases, ah. right? So, right. And then if we go into Cosmos DB, the first thing you're going to do is just give it a globally unique name. This is how you're going to access it as an endpoint. And we'll call this just my net Cosmos DB. And it's going to check that, make sure it's unique. And then here's the, the key step. What I've done is I've uh, opened this drop down and I can pick the SQL like interface, which is Document DB. MongoDB, Gremlin, or table storage. Mm -hmm. Now the important thing to note is if I create table storage, the API is going to look identical. I can take my old applications and just update the connection string and they'll work out of the box. What's different is the way I can manage this within the, the portal. And I've, I've got for my link shortening tool that I wrote, I have a Cosmos DB that is already in existence. Actually, we'll go to uh, this one, and I just wanted to show you quickly what that um, experience looks like. It's telling me, oh, you're, you're creating a new one. So if you look at the overview, we've got this region configuration, and it's showing me all the different regions. And right now, I'm just in hmm. Eastern US because I'm based out of Atlanta. But let's say I started to get a lot of users using my tool over you know, here in Europe or over here in, in the Eastern section. I can literally go in and click those on and start lighting those up for geo replication. So you can be quite surgical, if you will, right. in nature. Wow. So you've got that. The other interesting thing, and I don't want to go on too much of a, a tangent because there's a lot of, of science and math behind what these mean, but we're used to what we would call strong consistency. That's the SQL database. I commit something to that table. I have a consistent experience reading it back. There's a extreme on the other side of eventual consistency, mm -hmm. and this is more what I call sort of the, the Twitter scenario. As important as I think my tweet might be, someone on the other side of the world doesn't necessarily have to see it within milliseconds of me posting it. Mm -hmm. So that goes out to a database and fans out and eventually is consistent. We've got five levels that you can choose of consistency so you can even dial how fine-grained that experience is for replicating data and how quickly it does that. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm definitely familiar with those. I know that, um, uh, well, makes sense. So um, I guess what else should we know about um, Cosmos DB? Are there kind of any um, you know, challenges or surprises that developers run into that haven't used this 
database um, before that kind of are tips and tricks? Yeah, so I mean, I'd, I'd say there's two levels to that. There's definitely a jump going from a SQL relational database to a schemaless database. And it takes some, some getting used to. The nice part about it, though, is most developers working with SQL probably use some sort of object relational mapper, right? Entity framework is something that I see a lot of places because ultimately we program in classes the database is tables with relationships. What's nice about the Cosmos DB experience, whether you're using Document DB or you're using the MongoDB interface, which is the two I'm most familiar with, you can create a class and it'll automatically serialize the properties of that class. So it makes it very easy to create that instance of an object that you're gonna save to the database. I see, so I have a question on that, which is, like I said, I'm using Azure Table today. Um, I have a, you know, a POCO, right. plain old CLR object. And um, in order for it to interact with Azure Table, I have to make it, a, it has to derive from iTable entity, right. if, I, uh, if I recall correctly. And um, so with this model, does it have to, do, does it, do I have to change the inheritance relationship? My class, do I have to change it in any way to participate or does it just work automatically? It, it just works. If you're using the table storage driver, it's going to work the same way. Oh, of course. Because it wants the partition key and the row key. Yes. If you're using MongoDB or DocumentDB. Then it doesn't care. Then it doesn't care. So you can create, and I actually have a GitHub project called Explore Cosmos DB that uses the USDA database that's publicly mm -hmm. available from the, the USDA website. And the classes themselves are in a class library that have, they're just standalone POCO classes. Right. And it just understands how to map. And what, what I like about it, you're going to have a different experience if you go with Mongo versus Document DB because those are different drivers. It's transparent as far as the driver doesn't know, am I talking to a Mongo database or a Cosmos DB hosted in Azure? But the way those drivers are written, the MongoDB driver, for example, gives you ways to either work with structured data or non-structured data. So you can do, if people are familiar with JSON, right, as a document format, it provides a set of libraries that let you use sort of like the dynamic keyword, right, in, in yeah. C Sharp. Or I guess if you kind of poke into a little bit, sometimes you can just work with hash tables, like right. dictionaries um, directly. Yes. Yeah, makes sense. Um, let's see. Um, what else, what else should we be discussing here? Uh, I think, you know, the, the key points for, for Cosmos DB, when it came out, I was interested in it. But for me to actually understand something, I have to have a real world project. Mm. It, in my case, I decided to use a, a link shortening tool so that I could track metadata and basically capture things like when does someone click on a link? Are they clicking on it from Twitter or LinkedIn? So I was able to be, build that experience out. But what I found from that is having been working with databases for 20 years, the experience of being able to spin something up within literally minutes and installing a driver, putting a connection string in, and you're off to the races is a, is a great experience. There are some caveats. For example, if a developer is used to working with MongoDB, there's not 100% support for all of the types of queries you can do with MongoDB. There's certain types of group buys and aggregations and mapping functions that are specific to that that aren't supported, but 90% of the API surface area is there. Okay, so what about migration? Um, so say I have either an on-prem database that I want to make um, cloud, Cloudify, and so I think um, uh, um, Cosmos DB is the right, the right option. Or I have something already in Azure, um, say my Azure table. Right. Um, should I move that over to CloudDB or kind of just leave it as it is? Both, um, both those scenarios. You know, if your experience is working fine, if you don't need to take advantage of the new ones, for example, I'm running off the old table storage experience for storing my links. So I'm using the map the short URL to the long URL. That works fine on the old table storage. I'm storing the rich metadata that I'm data mining, basically doing analysis. That's what's going into Cosmos DB. So in my case, I'm using two versions. There is a migration tool that they provide. So if you're looking at migrating from a table or even from a SQL database, that tool basically lets you choose what you want to migrate and how it's mapping into what's called collections, which are the containers for data. So you can do that. And it just really depends on 
you know, what is your API? What are your SLAs? Do you want to be in the business of disaster recovery yourself, or do you want a service to do that for you, right. et cetera? Uh, makes sense. Uh, maybe a couple last questions is, um, you talked about Power BI, and uh, I know there's this other tool in Azure called Kusto, um, and I'm curious, like, what the experience is, is connecting those to um, CloudDB, and what you can do with them. Yeah, I haven't done as much with Kusto, but with Power BI, I have a full dashboard that I connected, and it was a straightforward experience. I literally gave it the endpoint and the secrets to access. Right. And what's nice is you can get a key generated that's just a read-only key, so even if someone grabs that, they can't modify your database. It will go through the document, and because it's schemaless, some documents may have certain properties, some don't but it'll scan through those and come up with, you know, here's the possible column names. And then the experience is just like when you've connected to a, a SQL database. You pick columns, pivots, group buys, aggregates, and you have that full experience of setting up line graphs and bar charts and, and everything else. So it's actually a pretty great experience once you have that data there. Okay, so in closing, um, so if I'm a .NET developer and this looks like it might be a good option for me for my next project, where would I go to get started? It's very easy. You go to docs.microsoft.com slash Azure and click on the .NET tab. And we have a ton of quick starts and, and sample tutorials that get you up and running with Cosmos DB. Okay, and, and uh, so that's docs, uh, which is awesome. Am I going to have an experience in Visual Studio as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And Visual Studio experience depends on the interface that you choose. So mm -hmm. you're either going to install most likely uh, some people are going to use the table storage, but you're going to install document DB, which is through the NuGet package manager, or you're going to install the um, Mongo DB. Okay. So you can create the Cosmos database from the command line or from an explorer. There's a number of ways, but the way you're going to interact with it is still at the end of the day going to be through that driver package that you install in Visual Studio. Right. Now, is this mostly for server side applications? So, like for, you know, ASP.NET websites and services, or would there ever be a scenario where I'd have, I guess, what you would call a two-tier architecture, where I, where I would actually call directly into um, Cosmos DB from um, either a mobile app or a desktop application? Uh, that's actually interesting because the MongoDB drivers are, are fully supported on the uh, node stack, for example, so you could do that. But again, that's on, I doubt you would be calling directly from the, the browser in that case, you would still probably have an API layer in between that to, to translate. But um, that, that's actually interesting. I'll have to look into that because yep. I haven't done MongoDB directly from the, the browser yet. I've done it. Yeah, in I didn't mean the browser apps. though. I meant uh, like from a, a rich client. Oh, mobile okay. I, I see what you're saying. Or yeah, th those can absolutely connect. So you have yeah. SDKs for all of those. And, and do you see people doing that uh, two tier architecture? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So that's still that's still a thing. Yes. And, and the nice thing about Cosmos DB is with your endpoint, you have that one endpoint you point to, but it's going to automatically load balance across your regions for you. So it takes that out of the equation. Nice. Okay. Well, this was a, a great talk, like great conversation. <laughs> Um, I learned a ton about um, Cosmos DB, and I think this sounds like an awesome option for .NET developers. Yeah, it, it's great. I've got a bunch of samples up on GitHub, and the documentation shows you through Document DB, MongoDB, Table, and, and Gremlin. Okay, so we'll make sure we put those links uh, at the bottom of this video. Great. Okay, thanks um, for watching uh, on .NET today. Hope you learned something about uh, Cosmos DB and about Azure. Thanks. Thank you.